Good evening. I'm Steve Calabresi. I work at the Political Theory Project here at Brown. And I'm here uh, to introduce to you Professor Randy Barnett from the Georgetown Law School. It is a great personal pleasure to welcome back to Brown Rand, one of the most distinguished law professors in the United States, Randy Barnett. Randy has been a good friend uh, for 27 years now since we first met at the Federalist Society Student Conference in 1986 at Stanford Law School. We invited Randy to that conference because we had heard he was a brilliant young libertarian law professor who specialized in contract law and we needed somebody who was libertarian for a panel on the Ninth Amendment. So we thought we would try and see whether Randy could fill in. Well, we didn't really know what Randy would say, but the panel was one of the best we've ever held. Randy ended up writing a definitive book on the original meaning of the Ninth Amendment, and he launched a career as a constitutional law expert that has established him as the paramount uh, constitutional law expert in the country. Uh, this event tells you pretty much everything you need to know about Randy. He is a passionate libertarian. He's tenacious and thorough. He loves history as well as law. He's a great debater. And he's an intellectual who knows how to write winning briefs in legal cases and how to argue a case before a court. I can add to that the fact that Randy has been a great friend to me over the many years since I met him in 1986. And Randy was, in fact, a key mentor to me when he visited at Northwestern Law School while I was an untenured faculty member there. To this day, I fully remember Randy explaining to me that I ought to write and publish as much as I possibly could, because if I did so, the threat of a tenure denial would simply fade away. I've never stopped following this advice. I do want to say something biographical about Randy, which is that he is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at Georgetown University. Randy did his undergraduate work at Northwestern University and graduated from the Harvard Law School. Randy tried many felony cases as a prosecutor and has published more than 100 articles and book reviews, as well as nine books. I assigned Randy's book, Restoring the Lost Constitution, the Presumption of Liberty, in my constitutional theory seminar last year at Brown, and the students loved it. Randy has also written an important constitutional law casebook, and his book on the structure of liberty, Justice and the Rule of Law, was published recently in Japanese as well as being published in English. Randy's op-ed pieces run regularly in the Wall Street Journal, and he's appeared often on television. He is a sharp and rigorous thinker and a really, really great person. It's a pleasure to be able to introduce to you this afternoon Professor Randy Barnett, who will be speaking to you on the very important topic, Watching You is the NSA Surveillance Constitutional. Thank you. Well, thank you, Steve, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, in fact, one of the nicest things about giving talks sometimes is the introduction, and after that it's downhill. Uh, but uh, I really appreciated that. I have to say that, uh, first of all, there's one actual error in your recollection of the event at, at Stanford, and that is that the panel I was invited to speak on was freedom of association in a, in a conference on the First Amendment, and my punchline for why it was that it was okay to protect the freedom of association, even though it was not mentioned expressly in the First Amendment, was the Ninth Amendment. Um, and basically, I just uh, said, uh, uh, and in my talk, I said, I know what you're thinking. What gives unelected lifetime judges, uh, uh, you know, lifetime appointed judges the power to protect this right that's not specifically enumerated in the Constitution? And sitting next to me at that time was Judge Frank Easterbrook of the Seventh Circuit. And Judge, Easter, uh, Judge Easterbrook, uh, after I asked this rhetorical question, he just sat sit next to me and he just went like this as though, you know, what, what could the answer possibly be? And then in response to that, I said, well, in the Constitution it says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And this huge roar came up from this Federalist Society crowd. So, uh, and years later, people came up to me and they said, well, I was there when you debated Frank Easterbrook on the Ninth Amendment. 
the debate which consisted of me asking a rhetorical question, him going like this, and me reading the words of the Ninth Amendment, and that was it. But it's funny that it made that impression on you, as well as other people. That the, and it was ex exactly what started me as a constitutional law professor. Until that day, um, I was solely a, a, con a um, contracts professor and really wanted to have nothing much to do with the Constitution because I felt if the Supreme Court was going to not pay attention to the Constitution, why should I? Uh, and so, uh, but at that point when I was, I had tenure and I decided, well, you know, should I be able to talk about this Ninth Amendment or not? Because it's somewhat disreputable to discuss it. I thought, um, well, it's still in the Constitution and they haven't repealed it and I do have tenure now, so I ought to be able to talk about anything in the Constitution that hasn't been repealed and I decided I would say that. But it was after that conference I decided I better learn something about what it actually means. And that's what started my thinking about the Constitution and then sort of one thing led to another because that, that darn constitution. It's all kind of interconnected. Um, and actually this uh, talked, so I really owe it to the Federal Society and that particular conference um, uh, for, uh, is what got me uh, into the mess I'm in now. So uh, I appreciate uh, the invitation back here. The last time I was here at Brown was I think two years ago to debate Charles Freed, uh, my former professor on the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Which I, just, which I argued for three years was unconstitutional, and which five justices of the Supreme Court agreed was unconstitutional, contrary to the predictions of most people, but then the Chief Justice decided to rewrite the law, so it said something other than what we were objecting to, and said, well, that law is constitutional, and we could uphold that one. So that's ultimately what happened. Uh, today, I move on to another area I, that I, is relatively new to me. Um, I was a criminal prosecutor in Chicago, and so I did have to know something about the Fourth and Fifth Amendment. Um, and, but it's not something I teach, uh, it's not something I've spent a lot of time talking about. But like the Affordable Care Act and before that the medical marijuana challenge I was involved with in the Rage case that I argued in front of the court, um, this is a public policy issue that I think is an important one and one that I might be able to add something to um, and, and, and therefore I've sort of weighed in on it, first in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal and then uh, in this talk that John Tomasi so graciously uh, invited me to uh, to uh, to deliver, and I and after I think after he saw my Wall Street Journal piece, and so I wrote this lecture for this venue and for this event, uh, even though I have given it a few places uh, as sort of warm up uh, acts like Berkeley, um, and at, at last week in Las Vegas, um, uh, just to see how it would play, and it, it seemed to play okay. So anyway, um, let me just give the talk, and then we'll see what you guys think about it. Uh, in recent months, due to the unauthorized leaks of classified information, we've come to learn that the National Security Agency, an executive branch, of the US, uh, executive branch arm of the U.S. military, has established several data collection programs. In this talk today, I'm not going to get into the details of these programs. Uh, because they are classified and the leaks of information about their nature have been partial, we cannot be certain of their exact scope uh, and their nature. Each week, it seems, we learn more about their operations. Uh, instead, I'm going to focus on the big picture. Uh, I am going to talk about constitutional law, and I'm going to talk about a couple of cases in constitutional law, but I assure you I will explain these cases thoroughly, and you will understand what I'm talking about when we're done. This is not going to be uh, esoteric constitutional law. It's going to be very commonsensical common, uh, constitutional law, even though I am going to be somewhat disagreeing um, with some constitutional law doctrine that currently exists. Um, as part of focusing on the big picture, I'm going to consider two features about these surveillance programs that we can be sure about because they have been confirmed. First, the National Security Agency is demanding that private companies with whom virtually all Americans contract to provide their voice communications. He is or it, it is um, uh, demanding that, they, that these companies turn over their records of every phone call that is made on their system. Uh, this metadata, as it's called, because it doesn't include the actual conversation, it only includes the information about who you call and when you call and how long you talk. This metadata is then stored on NSA supercomputers for later analysis. So that's the first feature of this, of this program I'm going to discuss. Secondly, the constitutionality of these programs is being decided in secret by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court known as the FISA court. I'm going to refer to it as the FISA court, even though at the end of my talk I'm going to give some reasons to doubt that it's really a court at all. Um, it's, not an, it's not an actual court as we think of courts, but it's called by the statute the FISA court, and it's conventionally just referred to as that, and so that's what I'm going to call it. For, FISA stands for Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. 
The procedure that the FISA court follows is an ex parte one. That's a lawyer's term for the fact that only one party uh, is in front of the judge that uh, decides these cases. The constitutional opinions of these judges are kept secret from the public um, and even from the affected parties themselves. Uh, although recently one opinion was disclosed pursuant to a Freedom of Information Act request by the Electronic Freedom Foundation, so we have one judicial opinion to go by. We actually have two because two weeks ago another opinion was declassified by the court itself in response to criticisms of it, and so now we have two judicial opinions. Up till now I've had to speculate, we've all had to speculate about what the basis was for upholding these laws, and now we have a better idea because we've been able to see a declassified version of the opinion. Jim Harper of the Cato Institute and I uh, have also argued in an amicus brief to the Supreme Court uh, challenging the constitutionality of this program um, that, the nat that the NSA data collection program is not only unconstitutional but it's also illegal. That is contrary to the law, uh, the statutory law, because it was not actually authorized, we argue, by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act as it has been modified by the USA Patriot Act. Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act allows the FISA court to issue orders requiring the production of tangible things upon satisfactory application by the FBI. The statutory language specifies that an application for a Section 215 order must include, quote, a statement of facts showing that there are reasonable grounds to believe that, a, a tan that the tangible things sought are relevant to an authorized investigation. A statement, so what it, you have to show is a statement of facts showing that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the tangible things sought are relevant to an authorized investigation. That's what the statute says. Because we maintain, Jim Harper and I maintain, that Section 215 orders must be relevant to an already existing investigation, in our brief we contend that orders for the seizure of bulk metadata on every American for future analysis to uncover evidence of wrongdoing is simply not authorized by the statute and are therefore it, it is therefore illegal. Uh, and ultimately, this, turn out, may, this may turn out to be the strongest argument we have against the program, not the constitutional one, but the statutory one. But today, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to dwell on that. You're just, we're going to put that aside. I wanted you to know we're doing it. It's another important issue. But I'm going to focus solely on the constitutional questions raised. Um, and I'm going to limit my focus to the two elements of this program that, I, that are the most disturbing. And that is the blanket seizures of private data on all Americans, and the fact that the constitutionality of the seizure program has been upheld in non-adversarial secret judicial proceedings. So if we assume for the sake of argument that these orders to compel the blanket surrender of phone records are indeed legal because they are authorized by the statute, then the next question would be, is, are they constitutional? Now, the Fourth Amendment has two parts. First, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. That's the first part. Second, no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. That's the second part. We know that the Fourth Amendment was adopted to prevent, among other things, what were called at the time general warrants general or nonspecific warrants, which were blanket authorizations for British authorities to search for contraband wherever they might choose. In response to this abuse, the Fourth Amendment requires the things to, the things to be searched and, or seized under a warrant to be described particularly. With this in mind, the problem with the data collection orders issued to Verizon and other telecommunications companies become obvious. These orders require the company to produce, quote, and this is the wording of the order itself, on an ongoing daily basis, all call detail records. On, on an ongoing basis, they're supposed to produce on an ongoing daily basis, all call detail records, unquote. Because they are not particular, such orders are the modern incarnation of the general warrants issued by the Crown. As with general warrants, blanket, search, blanket seizure programs subject the private papers of innocent people to the risk of search and exposure without their knowledge and with no realistic prospect of a remedy. It is also worth remembering that both the English Whigs and the American founding generation thought that the seizure of papers for later search was a distinct form, uh, was distinct from but equivalent to the use of general warrants, which is why papers is included in the Fourth Amendment in addition to effects or personal property. It says persons, houses, papers, and effects. 
Why doesn't it just say persons, houses, and effects if effects are personal property and your papers are personal property? Because papers was considered to be a separate, distinct, and egregious type of offense to seize papers. As University of San, Di San Diego law professor Donald Drips has shown in a recent article, quote, at the heart of the Whig opposition to seizing papers was the belief that any seizure search of papers, even for a specific criminal item, was a general search. It followed that any warrant to sift through documents is a general warrant, even if it is specific to the location of the trove and the item to be seized. So you might be specific as to where the papers are, but once you seize the papers, then you're going to search through the papers, and that is akin to a general search, and that's one reason why papers was separately enumerated in the Fourth Amendment. The seizure of one's papers for later perusal was thought to be closely akin to searching through a person's mind to assess his thoughts. And it also gave rise to what we would now consider to be a Fifth Amendment problem of self-incrimination. You're using your, someone's papers to incriminate themselves. Seize first, then search for evidence of criminality, was considered to be the epitome of the abuse of power. Putting such information permanently in the hands of government for future use is an invitation to restrict the liberties of the people whenever such restrictions become politically popular. For example, I like to tell my friends uh, my more conservative friends, um, as well as my more libertarian friends, um, that gun rights advocates, I like to remind them that gun rights advocates, of which I include myself, have long opposed firearms registration because the brute fact that the government does not know where the guns are makes it much more difficult to confiscate them in the future. Not only does this illustrate the practical danger to constitutional liberties posed by the government simply possessing vast information about our activities and associations for later search. The trove of phone and email metadata to which the NSA now has access would make gun registration unnecessary, as the government would already possess through information, uh, enough information via phone and email records to identify most gun owners that way. We're already hearing, for example, that the NSA is sharing data with the Drug Enforcement Administration. So if the reason why gun rights advocates are against registration is not because registration itself is going to mean the confiscation of guns, but because the information in the hands of government makes it easier to violate constitutional rights in the future when the political climate is right for that then, then that's another reason why we should be afraid of the government or we should be very cautious about the government having information about us doing everything else that we might, that we might, else we might be doing with our liberty. Now, we've got to turn to the law part. So how have these programs been justified as constitutional? And we now know specifically why they were upheld, because we've seen at least two legal opinions uh, by the court upholding them. The answer lies in two key Supreme Court cases I will tell you about now. Um, the first is the 1967 case of Katz versus United States, which concerned the power of law enforcement to wiretap a phone booth. And in this case, they were wiretapping a phone booth to detect evidence of bookmaking uh, uh, operations or betting operations that were being run by this particular Mr. Katz. Uh, and he was doing it in a phone booth. The case of Katz is said to stand for the proposition that the Fourth Amendment only protects communications about which people have, quote, a reasonable expectation of privacy. That's the key words. Because people reasonably expect their conversations in a phone booth to be private, and by the way, I at this point have to stop and explain to you what a phone booth is. Um, a phone booth um, is a structure um, that's usually made of glass or wood or uh, with a metal frame, you can usually see in it, and inside is a landline phone hooked up by a wire of some kind, um, in which in the old days you would dial and later you would push buttons on it and you would make calls, usually after putting coins into the machine. So it's very important that you know exactly what a phone booth is. I, I, I was uh, watching, I was walking past my, my son who was watching the original Superman movie uh, one day, and it's not some little kid, my son has grown, he's a former prosecutor himself, uh, works on the hill, but he was watching this old uh, Superman movie, and and I noticed at the beginning, and this was like one of the original Superman, like in the 1980s or something. And even then, when Superman went up to change his clothes to rescue Lois Lane, in his first, the first thing that was happening there, he walked up to a public phone that was just stand, it was like on a stand, but it was no phone booth, and that was the joke because he couldn't change his his cape and the, their phone booth because there are no phone booths anymore. So I figure if that was true in 1980, I have to explain to everybody what a phone booth is now. It matters to the law that you understand it's a closed structure you walk into and you close the door on. So anyway, uh, now we get back to the law part. Because people reasonably expect their conversations in a phone booth to be private, 
Their conversations cannot be wiretapped by law enforcement without first obtaining a warrant. That's what CATS stands for. And keep the, but you have to keep this phrase, reasonable expectation of privacy, in mind because it does a lot of work in modern constitutional doctrine. So CATS is the origin of this idea of reasonable expectation of privacy. So that's case number one that's used to support this law. The second key case is a case called Smith versus Maryland, uh, decided in 1979. Smith applied what is called the third party doctrine to phone call information that is in the possession of phone companies. In Smith, the court reasoned that individual phone users, and, and it, well, it, 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 I was about to interrupt my presentation. I see I explained it down here, so I'm not going to. In Smith, the court reasoned that individual phone users have no reasonable expectation of privacy in the records of their phone calls, that is, the numbers called and the duration of those calls, since phone users must know that a third party, the phone company itself, has access to this information. So you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in information that you're fully aware the phone company has knowledge of. And that's just the duration of your calls and who you're calling. Uh, the court therefore held in Smith uh, that law enforcement agencies do not need a warrant to install what is called a pen register uh, on a phone account that records and reports the numbers called and the duration of the calls, but not the content of the conversations. Um, so you can see if you put Katz together with Smith, you can understand what the legal argument is on behalf of this, and I'll talk a little more about that in a second. Uh, just a week, just a couple weeks ago, this was in, uh, the, I think it was now, let's see, what's the date today? It's about a month ago. The FISA court, responding to public concerns, released its previously classified uh, opinion upholding the constitutionality of the NSA's data seizure program, and from this opinion we learned that it thought that, quote, now I'm quoting the FISA court's opinion, the production of telephone service provider metadata is squarely controlled by the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Smith v. Maryland. So now we know that's the authority that the FISA court is relying on, and almost nothing other than that, frankly. There's not much more than that. I mean, Katz, then Maryland, Smith v. Maryland, and we're done. The court reasoned that the NSA data collection orders are constitutional because all they collect is the very information that Smith tells us telephone consumers have no reasonable expectation of privacy in under CATS. So I think at this explained this way, I hope you will agree that this logic does seem rather persuasive. You sort of need to know what the argument is in favor of this before you start hearing what the argument against it and why it has been persuasive enough to, to persuade uh, many legal commentators and experts, as long with the FISA court judges, and these are not bad people. The FISA court judges are not bad people. In fact, the order that was, uh, the existence of which was revealed by the Freedom of Information request was written uh, in a decision by Judge Roger Vinson, who was the district, uh, the, the district court judge in the Northern District of, Cal uh, of Florida that first held the individual, well, the, he's the second judge to do it, but he's the judge that held the individual insurance mandate to be unconstitutional as beyond the commerce power of Congress. And that was the case that went up to the Supreme Court. So actually, Roger Vinson is kind of a hero of mine. And yet, he's the one that found this logic persuasive because it does have a persuasive nature to it. Now let me tell you some of the things that I think is wrong with this. Um, first of all, I would say there's a very important difference between what happened in the Smith case and what the NSA orders are doing. In Smith, if we actually look at the real case, a robbery victim had described to the police both her attacker and a 1975 Monte Carlo she saw near the scene of the robbery. Afterwards, she began receiving threatening and obscene phone calls from the man who said he was the robber. During one of these phone calls, the man asked her to step out onto her front porch where she saw the 1975 Monte Carlo moving slowly past her home. Later, the police spotted a man who met the victim's description of her attacker driving a 1975 Monte Carlo in her neighborhood. By tracing the license plate number of that car, the police learned that the car was registered in the name of petitioner Michael Lee Smith. They then asked the phone company to install a pen register at its central offices to record the numbers dialed from the telephone at his home. Although the police did not obtain a warrant for this, they certainly had reasonable suspicion, to say the least, that Mr. Smith had engaged in illegal activity. If the constitutionality of the NSA's bulk data collection program is to be justified, as akin to a pen register under Smith, then these programs amount to installing a pen register on every American without any suspicion 
that a person whose phone activities are now stored in NSA supercomputers has done anything wrong. In essence, every American is to be treated the way Michael Lee Smith was treated in Smith v. Maryland. Now, in the old days, the very massiveness of such a data trove would have itself prevented the government from storing it or doing much of anything else with it. Today, however, enormous quantities of data can be, digi can be kept digitally in huge NSA facilities. Now, of course, because these programs remain a secret, we cannot be sure exactly how the government is using the information it is storing. In its most recent brief to the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, in another challenge, uh, uh, I have an amicus brief and a challenge that's in the Supreme Court. The ACLU has brought us another similar challenge in the, in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. In that case, in their recent brief, the government may intimates that the NSA is subjecting the data to computer analysis to reveal suspicious patterns, and that's largely how defenders of the program have defended it in the press. But others have defended the retention of the data simply to facilitate future search record, searches of records pursuant to later investigations, because if it's in their possession, they can more easily search it. Either way, the federal government can use bulk seizures of data um, without even a reasonable, they can obtain bulk seizures of data without even a reasonable suspicion for later analysis to discover terrorist activities. The very same way that the British used general warrants without probable cause to seize papers for later perusal to see if they reveal anything criminal. So first they get the data, then they supposedly run it under an analysis, and then the analysis reveals evidence of wrongdoing, and then they get a warrant for that. At that point, they do get a warrant, but they get a warrant after they've analyzed the data that they've already seized. Uh, so a warrant does come in here, but it comes in here later. Um, the NSA programs are therefore figuratively a fishing expedition. I refuse to say literally when I mean figuratively. NSA programs are figuratively a fishing expedition into the phone calling patterns of nearly all Americans. If this is the result of this legal analysis, then there must be a flaw somewhere in the constitutional doctrine that produced it. And indeed, the fault lies, I think, in the third party doctrine that was based on up the prevailing interpretation of Katz's concept of reasonable expectation of privacy. So now I'm going to give you uh, a reinterpretation of Katz uh, and then a critique of Smith versus Maryland. While Katz has become the lodestar in current Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, the reasonable expectation of privacy language that I told you has been taken away from Katz that now dominates the academic literature and the case law actually appears not in the majority opinion of the court but in a solo concurrence by Justice Harlan. Harlan's formulation has proven to be a weak rule for deciding cases. As Justice Alito observed two terms ago in his concurring opinion in the U.S. v. Jones case, which involved attaching a GPS tracker to a person's car, what Justice Alito wrote is, quote, <coughs> the cat's expectation of privacy test involves a degree of circularity and judges are apt to confuse their own expectations of privacy with those of the hypothetical reasonable person to which the CATS test looks. In addition, he said, quote, the CATS test rests on the assumption that this hypothetical reasonable person has a well-developed and stable set of privacy expectations, unquote. So he says it's circular. What it is you have a reasonable expectation of privacy will depend in part on what people you know, know is private or what they don't know is private, what, the government, what they know the government has or what they know the government doesn't have. It's circular, and it's not clear that hypothetical people have a uh, well-developed and stable set of privacy expectations. In our view, the reasonable expectation of privacy, our, I meaning Jim Harper in my view, the reasonable expectation of privacy test reverses the inquiry that ought to be required and we believe is required by the Fourth Amendment. In contrast with Justice Harlan's concurring opinion, Justice Stewart's majority opinion in Katz properly rested on the physical protection that the defendant had given to his oral communications when he stepped into the phone booth and closed the door. That's why you need to know what a phone booth is. What a, this is what Justice Stewart said, quote, what a person knowingly exposes to the public, even in his own home or office, is not a subject of Fourth Amendment protection. But when he seeks to preserve as private, even in an area accessible to the public, may be constitutionally protected. And then he went on to say, what Katz sought to exclude when he entered the booth was not the intruding eye 
It was the uninvited ear. He did not shed his right to do so simply because he made his calls from a place where he might be seen. No less than an individual in a business office, in a friend's apartment, or in a taxi cab, a person in a telephone booth may rely upon the protection of the Fourth Amendment, may rely on the protection of the Fourth Amendment. One who occupies it shuts the door behind him and pays the toll that permits him to place a call is surely entitled to assume that the words he utters into the mouthpiece will not be broadcast to the world. Rather than airy, unquote, rather than airy and untethered judicial speculations about reasonable expectations, the court should return to the traditional and more readily administrable property and contract rights focus of the Fourth Amendment protection that was reflected in the majority opinion in the actual majority opinion in Katz. Court should examine how people employ devices that function like the walls of the home or the phone booth in Katz to conceal digital information and preserve their privacy. An inquiry into the physical and legal barriers people have placed around their information, for example, by using passwords to restrict access to their email, um, which by the way, we're told, you know, they have to be strong, they have to be stronger, they're not strong enough, they gotta be your super strong, and you're not supposed to write them down on a piece of paper because somebody might see the piece of paper, so you gotta remember them, but they're so strong that you can't remember them. So this whole rigmarole we're going through is something we're going through in order to make sure that nobody gets to see these but us. Uh, that effort, um, or, or when we enter into terms of service contracts with third parties that include privacy protections as part of their terms, uh, these kind, an examination to that can generally answer whether the people have held information close and establish a threshold of personal security that the Fourth Amendment requires a warrant to cross. Because remember, we're not talking about the government's inability to get this information. We're talking about the government's inability to get this information without a warrant. That's all. They can get it. We're not saying they can't get it. We're saying they have to have a warrant before they get it. No distinction should be made between sealing a letter before handing it to the postman, taking a phone call in a secluded phone booth, protecting one's password, uh, email by a password, or selecting a communications company with a privacy policy. In short, the physical and legal barriers people place around their information define both their actual as well as their reasonable expectations of privacy and properly understood and should provide the doctrinal touchstone of the search warrant requirement. So you don't just talk about reasonable expectation of privacy as a free-floating idea. You talk about what measures have people taken in reality to mark off their information as private. Now, two terms ago, in the case of U.S. v. Jones I mentioned above, which is the GPS tracker case, the Supreme Court took an important step in this direction when it held that the reasonable expectation of privacy formulation in CATS does not substitute for or supplant the protection of one's property from unreasonable searches, but instead adds additional layers of protection to the protection we get just by being on our own property. The CATS reasonable expectation of privacy test, wrote Justice Scalia, has been added to, not substituted for, the common law trespassory test. The court should now recognize that when consumers enter into terms of service contracts with telecommunications companies that contain privacy assurances, they reasonably expect their information to be used solely in the ways specified in those policies. As Justice Marshall observed, and this is Thurgood Marshall, in his dissenting opinion in Smith versus Maryland, quote, those who disclose certain facts to a bank or phone company for limited business purposes need not assume that this information will be released to other per persons for other purposes. So just because the phone company gets to look at the records and you realize you are waiving your privacy vis-a-vis -vis them does not entail that you're waiving your privacy vis-a-vis -vis everybody else or anybody else. That is the flaw in the CATS analysis. When people put their information behind passwords, they reasonably expect it to be private, every bit as much as Mr. Katz did when he shut the door to the public phone booth. As Justice Sotomayor noted in her concurring opinion in the Jones case, that's the GPS tracker case, the third party doctrine, she said, is, quote, ill-fitted, ill-suited to the digital age in which people reveal a great deal of information about themselves to third parties in the course of carrying out mundane tasks, unquote. The NSA's program of what we ought to start calling pen registers for everybody, Pen registers for everyone has shown how both the conventional reading of Katz's reasonable expectation of privacy test and coupled with the third party doctrine of Smith are patently unsuited for the age of mass storage of data 
accessed in secret and analyzed by supercomputers. It's also useful to remember, I think, that Justice Stewart, the author of the Katz opinion, dissented in Smith v. Maryland. And here's what Justice Stewart wrote. I think that the numbers dialed from a private telephone, like the conversations that occur during a call, are within the constitutional protection recognized in Katz. It seems clear to me that information obtained by pen register surveillance of private telephones of a private telephone is information in which the telephone subscriber has a legitimate expectation of privacy. The information captured by such surveillance emanates from private conduct within a person's home or office, locations that without question are entitled to Fourth and Fifth Amendment, Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment protection. Further, that information is an integral part of the telephone communication that under CATS is entitled to constitutional protection, whether or not it is captured by a trespass into the area into such an area. Presciently, for purposes of analyzing the significance of installing pen registers on everyone, here's how, uh, what Justice Stewart added, quote, the numbers dialed from a private telephone, although certainly more prosaic than the conversation itself, are not without content. Most private telephone subscribers may have their own numbers listed in a public distri publicly distributed directory. That's a telephone book. I need to explain what a telephone book is. I mean, not everybody must know about that yet. There, it's an archaic device in which you have, it doesn't matter. I think you might know what I'm talking about. Let me back up here. Most private telephone subscribers may have their own numbers listed in a publicly distributed directory, but I doubt there are any who would be happy to have broadcast to the world a list of the local or long distance numbers they have called. Local and long, uh, this is not because such a list might in some sense be incriminating, but because it could easily reveal the identities of the persons and the places called, and thus reveal the most intimate details of a person's life. That's the data, that's the metadata that the NSA is now holding on us. When one has, and this is me now, not Justice Stewart. When one has arranged one's affairs using physics and the law of property and contract to conceal information from prying eyes, government agents may not use surreptitious means and novel technologies like thermal imaging, I'll get back to that in a second, to defeat those arrangements without obtaining a warrant that conforms to the requirement of the Fourth Amendment. For this reason, the court was correct in the 2001 case of Kelo versus United States to hold that police officers conducting a search, con had conducted a search when they used a thermal imaging device to detect heat emanating from a private home indicating marijuana cultivation is going on in that home because it, it greatly, it use, they use heat lamps, it greatly increases the temperature, and the police are sitting outside the home with a heat, uh, a, um, a thermal imaging device, and they can detect increased heat, and they use that as the basis for coming in. Backing up, the court was correct in its, in its 2001 case of Kelo versus the United States to hold that police officers conducted a search when they used a thermal imaging device to detect heat emanating from a private home, even though they had committed no trespass. Putting oneself behind closed doors created a zone of privacy into which the police ought not to intrude without a warrant. Justice Kagan, as Justice Kagan has explained earlier this year in her concurring opinion in Florida v. Jardines, which involved the use of a drug sniffing dog at the doorway of a home, quote, it is not surprising that in a case involving a search of a home, property concepts and privacy concepts should so align. The law of property, naturally enough, influences our shared expectations of what places should be free from government incursions, unquote. For these reasons, the court should either adapt the third party doctrine to modern circumstances or reject it altogether. And I think you can see from the quotes that I've already made from various justices, I think at least some of the justices, if not a majority of the justices, would be receptive to this kind of argument today. They are disturbed and concerned a little bit about what's going on and what the implications of the Smith v. Maryland doctrine is in the electronic uh, digital age. Now before concluding, let me move more briefly consider another serious constitutional problem with the NSA data collection programs. The judicial procedures provided by the FISA and Patriot Acts do not provide communications companies and their customers with the due process of law required by the Fifth Amendment, and I would say especially their customers. The FISA court is not just being used to approve particular national security warrants. Let me say, stop for a minute and explain to you why Section 215 was there and why the, the act was structured and why it was thought to be acceptable to, to do it this way before we knew about this program. 
And the answer is that when, when law enforcement gets search warrants approved by judges all the time, and they do so in an ex parte way. That is, a, a, a policeman goes to a judge and has the judge review the warrant and sign off on the warrant, and the other party who's being searched is not privy to that. So that's what we call an ex parte proceeding. When I was a prosecutor in Chicago, one of my jobs, uh, one of the procedures set up in Chicago at the time was that police had to come to a prosecutor, have us review the search warrant before they went to the judge to get it signed. And so we reviewed the search warrants first, um, but this was all done ex parte, and the other side didn't know about it and wouldn't know about it until the warrant was served. So what the Patriot Act, together with the, what actually initially the FISA court was initially set up uh, as a court to provide that service. That is, in a national security case, you want to be able to go to a judge and get a warrant approved, and you want to have a judge that's going to, reclass, you know, is going to have a security clearance so that you're not, you're not going to reveal the kind of uh, information that's going to be contained in that warrant. And that's going to be an ex parte proceeding in, that, in a national security case, just like it's an ex parte proceeding in criminal justice cases today. So, and, and not only that, but the judges used to be located in the FBI. They've now moved them over to the Prettyman Courthouse in, in DC, so now they have, a they have a, a courtroom and stuff. But it used to be they were sort of an adjunct of law enforcement and they were there convenient to law enforcement to get these warrants approved. And that seems like, that's as reasonable in that situation, in the national security situation, as it is in the, law, the typical law enforcement situation. But that's not the problem. The problem I'm pointing to is that this FISA court, this very same court, now has a courtroom. Now it's over in the uh, courthouse where the other federal judges are. And they're all staffed by federal judges. They're Article III judges that are appointed by the Chief Justice of the United States. So they are all sitting justice judges somewhere else that come and serve their time as FISA court judges. These judges are not only approving particular national security warrants, they're also adjudicating in secret in non-adversary proceedings, the constitutionality of the NSA's ongoing bulk data collection program. In other words, they're not just approving warrants, they're approving the whole program. And in opinions that we now can read, because they've been declassified, that argue why, that say why these, this program as a program is constitutional. No targeted customer has a right to intervene and contest the case nor even to read the FISA court's decision purporting to uphold the constitutionality of the seizure of data. Although, as I told you, they've just recently agreed, they've just recently voluntarily released one of their opinions. Um, in the cases that we are now litigating, one in the Supreme Court and one in the uh, District Court, the federal government is opposing um, our ability to bring suit because they say that either the Supreme Court doesn't have jurisdiction to hear the challenge out of the FISA court or that there's no standing for us to challenge it. So if the federal government is to be believed, if their position is to be believed, um, you can't challenge it in the FISA court and you can't challenge it out of the FISA court. You just can't challenge it, period. If that's, if their, I don't think their position will necessarily be upheld, but that's the position that they're taking. For a federal court to have jurisdiction under Article Three of the Constitution, there must be what the Constitution refers to as a case or controversy. And the Supreme Court has explained that a case and controversy requirement implies, quote, the existence of a present or possible adverse parties whose contentions are submitted to a court for adjudication. That's what a case or controversy is. It's adverse parties going to a court asking for an adjudication. The absence of adversarial parties therefore entails the absence of a genuine case and controversy, which means that the FISA court is not a genuine Article III court, but is instead simply a part of the executive branch doing internal operations for the executive branch. Or at, or at best, it's a judge approving a search warrant that's then going to go off. But it's not, a, it's not an Article III court. The deprivation of property by such a court in secret proceedings justified by secret orders and constitutional rulings is the antithesis of the due process of law that is guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment. So there's a Fifth Amendment problem here, and there's a Fourth Amendment problem here. Let me conclude by noting that without the recent leaks, the American public would have no idea of the existence of these programs, and it still can't be certain of their scope. Every day seems to bring new revelations about the domestic surveillance by federal agencies, and I haven't even really talked about the, the various programs that intercept and uh, uh, the metadata of our email communications. The secrecy of both the NSA surveillance programs and the legal proceedings upholding its constitutionality are inconsistent with a Republican form of government in which the citizens are supposed to be the principals or masters and those in government their agents or servants. For the people to control their servants, they must know 
what their servants are doing in general, in a general sense. That is, we don't need to know what individ about individual investigations of individual suspects. We don't need to know about that. But we do need to know, in general, about programs that are being aimed at us or elsewhere. The secrecy of these programs and the proceedings by which their constitutionality is being assessed make it impossible to hold elected officials and appointed bureaucrats accountable. <coughs> accountable. Internal government checks and even secret congressional oversight which allegedly exists here, but which we don't know about either, and so we can't hold those legislators accountable, are no substitute for the sovereign people being the ultimate judge of their servants' conduct in office. But such judgment and control is impossible without the information that secret programs conceal. Allowing the blanket seizures of privately held data would constitute an unprecedented legal and constitutional sea change. Um, let me just say something about that. The reason why our challenge to the Affordable Care Act uh, went as far as it did and was as successful as it was, uh, contrary to the expectations of most law professors, was because from the very beginning of our challenge, even before the bill was enacted, we characterized the individual insurance mandate as unprecedented, meaning never before in the history of the country had the Congress compelled people to engage in economic activity with a private company in order to therefore regulate them. So telling you, you must do business with a private company and then we'll regulate you. That's never been done before. We made that claim, we got that claim actually originally from a congressional service, a congressional, um, service report. Um, uh, it wasn't even something that we made up ourselves. And it's, and, and three years of debating this, um, uh, even though some professors uh, or some advocates rose up to say, well, there's this example or that. I mean, the militia in 1792, you had to go out and buy a gun, they said. I mean, I, I mean except for random examples like this, which actually did, were not that similar, um, uh, we basically sustained our claim that it was an unprecedented act. And no judge who considered the case in all the courts of appeals and district courts that considered the case uh, ultimately contested that. They all agreed this was a case of first impression. And the reason why that was so important to our litigation was because if it really was truly and relevantly unique, truly and relevantly new, then it meant all the existing precedent that was, is really about something else. All the existing doctrine can't be about this because this hasn't happened before. And that means we could get out from under what might look like inconvenient doctrine that would otherwise be used against us. And so I think that's what's important to stress. That's, what I, that's sort of what I'm bringing to the challenge. Uh, over That's sort of the legal tactic, you could call it or the theory that I'm bringing to this challenge, and that is to point out that the blanket seizures of privately held data would constitute an unprecedented legal and constitutional sea change. If I'm right about that, if it is relevantly unprecedented, just because something's new doesn't really make it unprecedented in the relevant set, but if this is really something different, that automatically means that all of this Fourth Amendment doctrine and Fifth Amendment doctrine that really probably is going against us is not exactly germane and can be distinguished the way I distinguish Smith v. Maryland to you today. Sure, Smith says what it does, but it also, look at the facts of Smith and tell me, was that case really about this thing? And if this thing is different, we have a chance at getting a different outcome than we would if we just followed the, law, the, other, the old doctrine. This policy, this, this unprecedented data surveillance policy, is not a policy that should emerge from an advisory panel of judges to which the people are not privy. The American people need relief from this unprecedented surveillance of them by those who are supposed to be its servants. And I believe this is more likely to come uh, from the Congress than it is from the courts, because the courts are ultimately not a very great bastion uh, of defense of our individual liberties. They can be, they should be, but they, off they more often will disappoint you than, uh, than not. And ultimately, I think the fact that there, this is a, 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 a bipartisan concern that cuts across parties and ideological lines is something that's going to move Congress to clarify really that what they meant in Section 215 is not what the FISA court has concluded, and I think we could nip this in the bud that way. Uh, but at any rate, this is a very important issue that I hope uh, uh, that you were interested enough in to come, and I appreciate you coming here, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments you may have. Thanks. So let me get myself mic'd up here. And anybody who has to get someplace, feel free to leave. I won't be offended. Sure. So I, I just thought I would uh, start with a, an initial question. Um, the Katz decision that Professor Barnett mentioned 
overruled a case called Olmstead against the United States in which the Supreme Court had held that uh, wiretapping was not a seizure or a search under the Fourth Amendment. Um, I completely agree with Professor Barnett that Cass is right and Olmstead was wrong, but that does raise a question about how to square Cass with the original meaning of the Constitution, something that Professor Barnett has written about in other contexts. The current Supreme Court is divided between two justices, Scalia and Thomas, who think property rights are very important in Fourth Amendment cases, three justices, Ginsburg, Kagan, and Sotomayor, who think that privacy interests are very important, and Justice Alito speaking for other ju justices who argue that we need a 21st century approach to 21st century problems. So uh, in short, the question is, what is the original uh, meaning say that's relevant to this question, and what do you think about the split on the current court between those three different camps? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, in terms of the original meaning, the Constitution um, requires that not only that, well, this is very loud, I don't know who's in charge of the mic here, but this is, uh, we turned down a little bit. Um, thanks. Um, the, uh, uh, the Constitution requires not only that searches be reasonable, but that the seizures be reasonable. It says searches and seizures. I think what's happening here is seizures. And then the question is, is the seizure reasonable? Uh, and um, I do agree that there appears to be the split, but even in, with the, the split that you're talking about, uh, Justice Scalia wrote that the property protections of, uh, are, in, ad, are added to the reasonable expectation of privacy. So reasonable expectation of privacy goes beyond property. He wanted to revive the idea of property as the touchstone, as a touchstone for when it is um, you have an expectation of privacy to the sort of general ephemeral uh, discussion of reasonable expectations. So in that sense, I think, at least take it, taken by what Justice Scalia said um, uh, in the Jones case, it was the Jones case not, wasn't it? Right. It was the Jones yeah. case. Yes. Then in the Jones case, then uh, I think this, the, these positions are consistent with each other. Um, and I think that, you know, even in terms of what Justice Alito said, I agree with him. I think we do need a 21st century approach. This is why I think that depending on how the case is framed and depending on what public opinion is by the time the case reaches the court, and it might be an argument for why we might want to wait before the case gets to the court until public opinion has a time to sort of uh, manifest itself. I think even Justice Alito might, be, uh, might agree that a 21st century approach to this is to say, let's look at the property protections that, pe that, that people have put around, the property and contract rights that people have put around their information, including, for example, password protecting their information, and that will be your 21st century touchdown of what is a reasonable expectation of privacy. That, so I agree with him that we do need to bring this up to the 21st century, and I'm heartened by the fact that all, in this case, we have sort of had three sort of contending positions on the court, all of the justices seem somewhat concerned about this. As well, they should be. It's their phone records, too, that have been swept up into all of this. And so they're not immune, as none of us are immune, from having their, their phone records in the possession of the National Security Agency. Yes? Um, do you see a, a bright line between what we've given up in our privacy to all private companies and businesses, which you know we're becoming more and more aware of, versus giving that to the government? Uh, I do think there is a significant line between those two things. Um, oh, uh, yeah, it's a good, very good. Thank you. Uh, the question is: Is there a bright line uh, between the privacy that we've surrendered up to private companies and and something that we might have surrendered up or something or letting the government know about this information? I do think there's a significant difference. Uh, one is that uh, I think most of us do it knowingly, um, and we get something in return. So, and, and if you don't want to get the thing in return, I mean, there's some times in which you can say, well, maybe you don't. But in most cases, most of the things that we can say, the privacy that we give up, we, do, we understand that we put stuff on Facebook, other people can see it. We understand that if we use Gmail, and I'm an avid Gmail user, that Gmail reads it. That's how we know that all those ads are popping up about the stuff that we are doing. And, and, that, and we all know that when we, you know, we go shopping on Amazon for one thing, and then for three weeks later, all the ads on all the websites we visit are the same product we've just been looking for for three weeks ago. So we know that there's been data mining of our, of our uh, uh, information. As I said, if you don't want that, 
then you don't have to do business with that. You don't have to deal with that. You can, there are private, secure, encrypted email service providers you can use if you don't like that. Unfortunately, the government is putting them out of business uh, because they're demanding the encryption keys for the encryption so that they can have a backdoor into these systems even though the company and the customers don't want to give them that and they should not be allowed to do that. But they're whole, they, they, in one case, they, they held one company in contempt for not, or they, they asked that company be held in contempt for not turning over the keys, the encryption keys, to the email, and that company decided to go out of business rather than do that. So, I mean, we ought to be able to choose that kind of privacy if we want it. The government doesn't want us to choose it, but if we don't, I think we have to live with the consequences of that. However, having said all that, I do think, I, I mean, it's not that I trust Google, I mean, because I don't, I have my issues with Google uh, as well. I mean, it's just I don't, I don't love Microsoft either. Um, and I don't do as much business with Apple, so it's not like I, I have any dog in this fight, but I will say that I do uh, uh, trust Google more uh, to just be using the information for commercial purposes and not really to invade my privacy, because I know that if they were ever to do that, um, and it was ever to be known they would do that, there would be a mass exodus from their services, and I know that, and they know that, they know that I know that, and that's what sort of keeps them in line. In addition to the fact that, as we all know, there are privacy advocates, people whose full-time job is to look out for our privacy, and we, some sort, we sort of delegate to them to be the sort of uh, canary in the coal mine. And they survey, they read these privacy uh, agreements, and they're constantly on these companies if those privacy agreements get weakened too much, and then they sort of sound the alarm, and other people rush to the, uh, rush to the, uh, uh, the sound of the alarm. And so, um, with all of that protection, I'm comfortable with that. I am not comfortable with the government holding all this information to be used for whatever purposes they might in the future choose to use, either legally or illegally. I mean, there is a problem with them abusing the information illegally, and we can't stop them. We don't even know if they're doing it. And then there's also the problem of, in the future, when another terrorist attack happens and public uh, and it's done in a certain way, and then all of a sudden, out of the desk drawer comes a new policy proposal that was, has been waiting for the opportunity, what is politically right, to have it enacted, and then the new policy proposal is enacted into law, and all of a sudden, hey, we got all this information, let's make use of it. We've got drug, and, drug laws to enforce, we've got all this information, let's make use of it. And what's to stop that from happening once they have it? And so I do think there's a, there's a bright line or a categorical difference between the government holding all this information and private companies in competition with each other holding some of this information. I just wanted to remind everyone, if you have a question, please come to one of the microphones oh, okay. and ask a question at the microphone. That way, everyone in the audience can And I think it. it's being recorded also. So Thanks. this way, your question will get on the uh, recording. Yes, sir. I just have two, uh, I'm from the class of 83, I just had two quick comments. One is uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the work you do. Uh, the second comment actually you just mentioned, and that is I think it's very important for everyone to understand that the federal government, the executive branch, already has all this information on the, the judges and the judges' families, their nieces and nephews, grandchildren. And so the executive branch has tremendous leverage in the real politic world over the judges already. So whatever comes out of the Supreme Court or any lower courts, we have to remember that in a real politic world, those judges may already have been compromised. Thank you. Well, um, let me just say I was a prosecutor in Cook County, Illinois. I don't know if anybody knows anything about <laughs> Cook County, Illinois, but in, in Cook County, you, in fact, at the time I was a prosecutor, unbeknownst to me, there was an undercover uh, uh, federal investigation of corruption in the Circuit Court of Cook County. And it turned out that the best man, uh, not the best man, but one of the groomsmen at my wedding, um, who I was very close to, uh, and who I thought had actually become a corrupt lawyer, and therefore I sort of broke off my contact with him, was actually, had become an FBI agent, uh, sort of, a, 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 posing as a corrupt lawyer, uh, in order to do a sting operation on judges in the Circuit Court of Cook County. So, I'm pretty cynical uh, and I'm pretty skeptical and there's a saying in Cook County when you're a prosecutor and those of you who are lawyers elsewhere may know this saying and that is you never know who you're talking to because you say you've been talking to this gentleman over here but I don't know who his friends are and I don't know who he talks to. So you, you always have to uh, be aware of this sort of thing um, and that includes what you just, considerations you've just said. But having said that, let me just suggest that when I talked about this topic at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas uh, over the summertime to some of uh, a libertarian gathering, I think there can be a tendency 
uh, to um, uh, go overboard in assuming that you know terrible, bad, awful things are happening at the moment. And I think that even though terrible, bad, awful things have happened in the past and can happen in the future and may also be happening now, I think it's it's important for us to keep ourselves grounded. And by the way, this is no I'm not casting any aspersion on your comment because I'm not saying you don't you're not grounded. Uh, but I'm just saying it's important for us when we think about this sort of thing to keep ourselves grounded and realize that many of the, the people that work for the NSA are there, they're patriotic Americans, they're there to protect us uh, as best they can. They are not bad people. That There may be bad, some bad people there, but that's not the people that want to go to work for the NSA because they're bad people. And that's true of people uh, in government generally. And that we should assume we can't even assume that they're all acting in good faith to the extent possible, even though we know there are abuses. Having said all that, giving them every benefit of the doubt, it's just too dangerous for them to have this information. It's too dangerous because of the reality of corruption that can happen and the reality of intimidation and because of the appearance of it. And, and you've just pointed to the appearance of it. And so we can keep ourselves grounded and we don't have to go off the deep end in fearing things that have happened that we don't know have happened and still be extremely concerned uh, that this program is something that is extremely unwise as a matter of public policy and should be stopped and nipped in the bud and stopped now because once they have this capability, they're not going to readily give it up. Yes? Um, yes, you mentioned uh, the case with the, the GPS tracker. And there have been a lot of other cases recently where um, there's been, you know, a, like individual data points that have been taken that maybe themselves aren't necessarily uh, warrant requirements. Um, so, for example, I mean, the, the GPS case is a good one, but uh, to go even further, things where like you know people are walking down the street and there are security cameras. Clearly, they have no expectation of privacy from the security cameras, and yet there's this sort of sense that um, they do have an expectation of privacy in their entire movements throughout the day that can be you know that can be sort of gleaned from looking at the at the uh, complete picture of all of those things put together. Um, where do you see those sorts of uh, interpretations fitting within like <clears throat> within the Fourth Amendment? Is there a way for us to actually like make that jurisprudence, or does that have to be like actual and new constitutional law? Um, it's a good question. And let me just say right off the beginning, because this may actually apply to other questions besides this one. I haven't really thought about all the different types of privacy invasions that we possibly can face. Now or in the future, I mean, I watch television. I, you know, I watch uh, the Bourne you know, movies, and I see what they claim they can do, which I don't believe they can do half of what they show in that movie. But someday they can. Um, and uh, you know, I like the CD show MI5, and I see what they can do with the uh, CTV. You know, see, there's always CTV on everybody, just, just in facial recognition in the industry. I mean, all this stuff, I, I think they don't have quite as much capability as, as, as fictionally as nice to portray. But nevertheless, they've got a lot, and they, and they can only get more. And I'm not exactly sure where the line is with all that stuff. I mean, I do think when you're in public, you're in public. But when you're in private, you're in private. So I do think that. Uh, when we're addressing a program like this, I think it's important to focus on, in some respects, the gross nature of this program, the massive nature of this program, the, pro the fact that it sweeps everybody in the country who uses a, uh, a phone uh, into the program, and the internet programs that I didn't mention, the email programs I didn't mention, because I don't, we don't know as much about how they work, and I haven't thought about them as much. They sweep up all the metadata of all our email traffic, and that's pretty much everything. And that's what I think we have to focus on. Let's start here, because that's the kind of thing you can win. I mean, you can, and you can win it in the legislative branch, and you can win it in the judicial branch, because it's big, and it's dangerous, and innocent people are obviously included. And at that point, we can see where we're going to go with respect to other types of programs that might be more um, in a gray area. Yes? Um, I'm going to bring my question around your example of Google, although it's not um, specific to Google. Um, you talked about how these internet um, providers such as Google using Gmail will data mine your emails and send you um, specific ads towards you. And your example of how, the, how uh, the NSA is unconstitutional was due to the fact that they were without a warrant data mining um, s um, sets that they had taken, which you would assume would be um, you would assume would be private. But Google's left to do this being that's a private company and choose to do business with them. Um, but my point is being that Google has the um, data stores, and the fact of the matter is that the reason that the government is really um, is storing, you're saying this, the fact that the government is storing the data is something illegal, something they can, um, late, in later times when they receive a warning for things that they think is bad, they can go back and find all the data. But the thing, but the reality being that this data is actually already 
being recorded and exists for the government to go back and receive, whether it's in a Google database or an NSA database. So what, what's, is that really unconstitutional if they go back and they go through all the records of Google if they decide to warn one person, even if they're not storing it in NSA? It's a, it's a great question, and it actually helps me more additionally address uh, this, this woman's question here. Uh, and that is that um, it actually matters that the government has to take a warrant. The government has to go over, take a warrant from over here and go over here. It mattered in the old days that the government had to get the phone company to put the pen register on your phone line. The government couldn't do it itself. It had to get the phone company to do it. The very fact that law enforcement has to... Now, in the case of phone records, we now find out that there are phone company uh, uh, employees that are permanently assigned to the government units, and so that actually sort of cuts down on the barrier, the separation of powers that I'm now talking about. But this is a structural uh, constraint on what governments do when they have to go out of their office and walk over to that office and they have to say, here's what I've got and here's what I want. And so I feel better. And first of all, Google doesn't have everything. They only have what Google has. And we can do business with Google or not as we wish. So based on that, I think it makes a huge difference whether the NSA can just, on their terminal, come up with this data themselves individually or whether they have to actually get a warrant and go out and serve Google with it. That is a structural constraint on what they can and will do, especially when they have to focus on individual people. Remember, I am not opposing the idea that government can obtain a warrant when they're in an investigation and they have a, uh, a probable cause to believe this person's engaged in activity, as they had probably with respect in Smith versus Warren, in, in Maryland itself. That was certainly probable cause. They just didn't go get a warrant. Um, and I think that's what they should have to have. Yes? Um, shed some light on the distinction between um, the information that Edward Snowden has recently revealed in terms of the activities of the NSA and the FISA courts um, to that of uh, James Banford's information that he's published for the last, I guess it was four or five years ago, his book, The Shadow Factory. Now, I'm not familiar with the last book, uh, and I'm, I really haven't followed the Snowden case that closely other than you know reading in the press like everyone else. Uh, uh, what we know, uh, so I'm, we're using a lot of what he, we, he's released, but whether I know everything that's released, I just don't think I'm in a position to answer your question. Okay. Do you have something well, to Well, but basically, Bamford revealed the activities of the, of the FISA courts and the NSA and what they were doing, and, and, and I, I've been puzzled, as because I, I read this book four or five years ago, and I've been so puzzled as to why there's such this big yeah. to do about it when it's something that's been known. I, I just read, I just read. Bamford's not being hunted down where Snowden is, and, and I'm just I just read a, uh, I don't know if it was a blog post or a magazine or something online, um, and which gave a nice interesting, they were actually, um, um, anal it, was a, it was an analysis of, uh, what, uh, the, of Glenn Greenwald, Greenwald's um, new um, uh, journalism project that he's getting involved with. They're starting a $250 million journalism project that he's now left the Guardian, and he's the person that that Snowden uh, has been working with Snowden and releasing this information through the Guardian, and now he's forming another media. He's joining another media company, um, and one of, and the analysis of the significance of this is was that um, it turns out that it was really important to release it to the newspapers because there's information overload. We are all subject to information overload, and there's lots of information out there. There's too much information out there for us to process as individuals. And so you may you know that book, I don't know that book, it's a book. We don't know, there's so much to process and we don't know what to believe. And it turns out that at least sociologically, whether this is justified or not, one of the things that causes information to become knowledge, this is what, I don't know if I totally buy into this analysis, but I'm repeating to you what I read and I probably day before yesterday. One of the things that causes the information to become knowledge is the fact that it's disseminated by a gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper, in some sense, validates the, the importance and the credibility of the information that is otherwise just free-flowing. So according to this thesis, and it makes sense to me, the very fact that the Guardian was the source, as opposed to WikiLeaks, which is just a website, the fact that it's the Guardian rather than a website that's the source of the information gave it extra traction and, would, and, and, and propelled it into the public consciousness in a way that a book might not have done. I don't know if that's true, but it's an explanation that I just read, and it sort of makes sense to me. Um, and it's funny, James Stanford is not, I mean, he's a, he's a 
you know, light, but he was the one who actually revealed the existence of the NSA back in, I think it was the early 80s. So it's, it's fascinating. Anyway, um, I wanted a quick question um, in reference to your comment about the ACA and the reason uh, in your position. How do you compare that with the federal requirement that we all have to get car insurance? <laughs> Yes, I have just had a flashback to being here around two years ago, uh, debating that very issue. Um, I don't know that we want to get into that, but let me, let me just suggest that uh, the distinction that we made and I think was persuasive, and that is that uh, when you choose to do certain activities, then the government may regulate how you do those activities. So when you open a restaurant, then the government may say you may not discriminate, but it can't compel you to open a restaurant. It, it can't even compel a racist to keep a restaurant open should they decide they would rather go out of business than to serve black people. So there's a difference between making you do something and telling you that if you're going to do something, then you have to do it this way. Um, and and it, the, if you're, you know, the regulation of things that you've chosen to do is something that's pervasive. Obviously, we could not go after that. I mean, we didn't, wouldn't necessarily want to go after that. That's pretty much what all regulation does. If you're going to build a house, you have to build it this way. If you're going to make a contract, I'm a contracts professor, if you're going to make a contract, you have to make it this way. This is just standard, what law does. It doesn't tell you you must make a contract, you must do, you must buy this product from a private company so that we may then regulate you. There's a categorical difference between those things. And the Commerce Clause, the Commerce, the Commerce, the Commerce Clause uh, gives Congress the power to regulate commerce uh, between, uh, uh, among the several states. So you have to first be engaged in commerce before they are regulating it. It doesn't give commerce the power to order you to engage in commerce so that they may then regulate you. Okay. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, you argued uh, that the word paper that appears in the Fourth Amendment uh, should be construed to mean also information of privacy. Uh, looking at the uh, original public meaning of the word paper, I was wondering if it is easier for you to make your case looking at the word paper in light of the word effect that appears after paper in the same clause than the word paper alone, because it seems to be like a, 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 quite a bit of stretch to say that a paper can go that far, but the word effect that means uh, any changes that occur as a result of your actions uh, is, is broad enough. To, to make a case because the word effect could have, could have in fact been used in the class to uh, avoid the problems that could have been caused by uh, the principle of inclusio unius exclusio alterius, inclusion of one exclu excludes another. If you say person, uh, houses, and, uh, and papers, then it seems like you're limiting the protections to all those three, but once you come and uh, add the word effects, after those three words, then it seems like you are trying to solve that problem by using a broader word. So I was wondering if uh, that would be uh, a plausible interpretation. Uh, it's entirely a plausible argument. I don't know if everybody understood the argument, but I, it's actually interesting. The argument is that papers means papers, and digital information is not actually on paper. And therefore, it may be a stretch under the original meaning of the clause to include that under paper, but effects seems to kind of be a sweeping clause in a way to sweep in everything else that might not be a paper. And so it doesn't really matter so much whether it's specifically a paper or not. Effects that covers everything else you might have. Is that your point? Yeah. So that's a very interesting point. It's a good one. I, I will actually think about that. It, and I might even use it sometime if I'm challenged on papers. But, um, the, but the other thing I would also remind you is this was, by the way, one of the purposes of uh, the Ninth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, which means that just because something is put in there, that principle of expressio unius that says the expression of one thing is the exclusion of the other thing, the specific reason why the Ninth Amendment was put in there was to defeat that principle, so that our rights would not be limited to what was put in there by the argument, well, if because this was put in there, that excludes this other thing. The Ninth Amendment, everything we know about the Ninth Amendment, says that it was put in there to defeat the operation of that principle with respect to the enumeration of rights because it was thought that the danger of putting any rights in would be that principle would be used to say that's the only rights you have and the Ninth Amendment was there to, to deny that principle. So I would invoke the Ninth Amendment against that argument if I, if I ever hear it. How are we doing that time? Do we have to close up? Uh, maybe we could take two quick questions. Maybe you could both state your question and then Professor Barnett could respond. Uh, can you briefly describe the impact of parallel construction of due process? 
Can you repeat that a little louder? Sorry, uh, can you briefly uh, speak to the impact of parallel construction of the process? I, I don't really understand, I don't know what you're, I don't know what that is. Uh, parallel construction is the process by which uh, NSA data is provided to say another uh, agency like the EPA oh. used to prosecute, provided that they are able to reconstruct the chain of events. Um, obviously, uh, I don't have an opinion on that. I, mean, a, I, I have heard of it. Um, so no, I don't have an opinion on that. Sorry. I guess that's what that's what we in the law trade call one question too many. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe I want to <clears throat> kind of uh, erring as a devil's advocate to the not being too crazy worried about the NSA and yet embracing you know your concerns about. about by the way, whenever anyone says they're playing devil's advocate, it means you are advocating the position of the devil. <laughs> That's, and, 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 and I, of which I'm often accused, so there's no problem there. But uh, in, in this context, I often, in, in like looking to his, histor say that, historical analogies, as we often do to try to figure out the digital world, I think of earlier cases, uh, of one that comes to mind in New York City that was relatively famous where, it, where a criminal used an ice pick. And ultimately, the, the, the method that the police used was going to purveyors, uh, hardware stores, and people that might purvey that and asking to whom they had sold an ice pick. And in some ways, that's modestly, uh, although not identical, it's modestly analogous to going to a company that has you know, carried your, your digital mail and saying, hey, did you carry any digital mail for this, or you know, who did you carry it to? Now, in those cases, they had a kind of they had an artic an item they were looking for. It was relatively specific, but I don't seem it, I don't seem or have never found that they took warrants or took a warrant approach to going to someone that you had had commerce with and asking them about that commerce, even though you only revealed to them what you were buying so you could pay for it. And and so um, one and that and I think we would be relatively comfortable that that was good gumshoe police work. They knew right. used the and they just went to every store and found out where an ice pick was bought. And it, could one say this is just a really digital version of that kind of work? It's a, it's really a great question, and I like it a lot. I, and and it's it's it's. Let me just before I try to answer it, let me just suggest that this is what happens when you get into one of these controversies. It's happened to me in the healthcare case. It happened to me in the medical marijuana case. That is, you start in one of these things, you go out and you give these talks, and you get question about this and question about that, and gradually your arguments get refined and built up, and you go, you go away from something, you think about, well, there's an analogy I hadn't thought of, and here's a practice, and this thing parallel, what is it, parallel? Parallel what? construction. Parallel construction, I'm gonna find out what that is, I'll Google it, right? And then from now on, I'll get parallel construction everywhere I go. Uh, so, um, uh, so I like, so this is the process so that, it, that, that we as advocates undergo as we're building, getting involved in one of these controversies. So I would just say off the top of my head how I would, I would, I would make two points. One is that in the physical world, um, there were built-in automatic constraints uh, that caused us not to have to think about things that much because there are inherent limits on what can be done in the physical world. Um, and that's the reason why if, they, if in the past, uh, a government agency had asked to seize all the phone records of every phone company in the, in the United States and they had been delivered in paper things, it would have been like, well, who cares? I mean, there's not much they can do with that anyway. And so that's the first, I would say, is so things that are analogies in the physical world with things like that are inherently limited don't necessarily carry over to the digital world in the age of supercomputers, which gives people capabilities of doing more than than they used to be able to do. And the other thing I would say is that that's an individual investigation as opposed to a, uh, a, a, data, a data collection on everybody. And so it would be like saying that because that might be a useful inquiry, the gov all hardware stores have to report to the government everyone who produces a pick so that in the future, if anybody uses a pick in a crime, we can figure out who has the picks. That would be, in the physical world analogy, to this particular problem. And that's the reason why I think, even though it's kind of chal it's challenging, um, I think it doesn't carry over. But I, but I don't want to, I don't want any of us to leave here thinking that these questions are easy to answer. Because we do want uh, uh, the government to be protecting us from terrorist activities. We do want them to be uncovering plots. We don't want 
they were not able to do it in the, Boston, in the case of the Boston bombing, even though the Russian government had put them on notice that the particular individuals here were dangerous and they ought to be looked at carefully. Nevertheless, they didn't, they didn't you know, this is, you know, the NSA data surveillance program where they're trying to find a needle in a haystack by using algorithmic analysis. This is one of the only programs in which you, make, you, you, you solve the needle in the haystack problem by making the haystack as big as possible. And so you, that's their theory. You know, it, after they used the, you know, once they can convince me they used all the information they actually have through the old fashioned way of getting information, like the Russian government telling them these guys are dangerous and you should talk to them, and they actually do something about that, then I'll believe. I'll be a lot more open to the possibility that by giving them information about everyone in the country, they're going to be able to find those Russian, uh, or the Chechens, or whatever they were, these immigrants. We're going to be able to find those guys by using their algorithms that they weren't able to find when the Russians told them to go talk to them. <laughs> so that's the reason why I think we have to be very careful about going from the real that to this. And, but also that we want them doing these things. We want them protecting us. And so there are going to be programs that have to be kept secret. And, uh, we're going to want them to be operational, but we have to be careful when we discover, even if it's by illegal leaking, when we, or by a book that we didn't read, uh, when we discover that in fact they're collecting data on all of us, and at that point we need to do something about that. Anyway, thank you very much. Let's thank Professor Barnett very much for a wonderful time.